In this lecture, we'll be looking at the series of events from Brundisium to Actium. We'll begin by looking at the circumstances that led to the Pact of Brundisium in 40 BC and the reaffirmation of the alliance between Octavian and Antony. And then look at the conflict between Octavian and Sextus Pompey and eventually the exile of Lepidus. And finally, Antony's activities in the East and the factors that contributed to the breakdown of the alliance between Antony and Octavian. So in 40 BC, Octavian decides that he's going to take over Antony's province in Gaul. Antony, remember, is in the East dealing with the veterans from the Battle of Philippi, and Octavian had been sent back to Italy to do the same. So Octavian oversteps his bounds and decides that he is going to take over control of this very important province of Gaul. It's ex an extraordinarily aggressive move, and it's one that Antony cannot just let happen. Um, he needs to react to it. And so Antony realizes that he needs to leave Egypt, where he's been hanging out in 40, and return to Italy. And the agreement is that they will meet in Brundisium. So this is the port on the Adriatic side. It's an easy place for them to meet when Antony comes over from the east. So we have then a meeting between Antony and Octavian in which they reaffirm their alliance um, and renegotiate some of its terms. It's, there's a reconciliation between the two. And it, the deal is sealed by the marriage of Antony to Octavian's sister, Octavia. Um, and again, we see the use of marriage being used to seal a political alliance. This marriage between Antony and Octavia is probably what is the um, topic of Virgil's very famous fourth eclogue, when he talks about the return of a golden age, the birth of a golden child. It's the poem that eventually gets um, cited and uses evidence that Virgil was a pre-Christian and he's anticipating the birth of Christ. Well, more than likely, what he's actually celebrating is the potential for peace now that Antony and Octavian have renewed this alliance, sealed it with a marriage, and the hope is that a child will be born that will further seal that alliance. And here we have a coin that is actually, again, commemorating the renewal of the alliance between Antony and Octavian. And so you have Octavian is the, the plain-haired character um, on the right-hand side of the coin, and on the left-hand side, we have um, Antony w wearing a kind of um, diadem, um, but sort of a, a hair um, ribbon in his hair, um, and so and with much more um, sort of curly hair. Um, Octavian looks much more severe, and this this portrayal is deliberate. Part of the, the, the deal that is also negotiated at Brundisium is a, a um, sort of shuffling of provinces. So it's now decided that Octavian will, in fact, control the West, including Gaul. Antony will have the entire East, and Lepidus gets Africa. Um, so we see here the extent to which Lepidus is basically the new Crassus. He's the one that is the least powerful of the two, and that it's really going to come down to a conflict between Octavian and Antony in the end. The other thing that remains to be dealt with um, as the Second Triumvirate goes into the 30s BC is the problem of Sextus Pompey, the surviving son of Pompey. And you'll remember that he had been declared an enemy of the state in, as part of Octavian's um, consulship, but he hadn't really been dealt with sufficiently. Um, and he, in fact, had a lot of popularity and troop support, especially down in southern Italy around the Bay of Naples. And he, he had built up a pretty substantial fleet. So there was a basic interest not in confronting him directly, but in negotiating some kind of deal that would manage him. And there's an image of Sextus in this coin on the left. And part of the fact that he's even represented in a coin that he himself has arranged to be issued shows, again, the, the power that he had, that he was no um, easy enemy to deal with. In 39, he had negotiated a deal with Octavian that, once again, in, in involved a marriage. Um, it was a, one of his family members, a woman named Scribonia, was going to be married, um, was in fact married to Octavian. 
And this was meant to, again, seal that alliance and make sure that the two of them stayed on reasonably um, friendly terms, or at least that they didn't go after one another. He was also promised that he would get control of Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and eventually the Peloponnese and Greece. So these, these islands that were incredibly important to Rome, um, particularly because of their mineral wealth and, um, in some cases, the, the grain that they produced. Um, so this is a pretty favorable deal for Sextus Pompey. But it eventually falls apart. It falls apart pretty quickly. Um, Scribonia does produce a, a daughter. It's Octavian's only child, a daughter named Julia. But very quickly, he divorces um, Scribonia. So it indicates that he's not going to respect this arrangement with Sextus Pompey. They, there's also delays in handing over these lands to Sextus Pompey. And so what had been negotiated in 39 falls apart pretty quickly. Sextus then wages a couple of successful wars against Octavian in Italy, down in the Bay of Naples and also in the Straits of Messina, so this, this very important trade route. Octavian is in a desperate position. He has been really defeated by, by Sextus, and it's clear that he is not a military man. He needs Antony's help, and he needs troop support from Antony. So part they negotiate another deal, there's a renewal of the triumvirate in 37, and Antony provides troop support and fleet support in exchange for future support from Octavian. So it's a good deal for Octavian because he gets the immediate benefit but doesn't have to cough up his end of the promise until later. Eventually, then, with this additional troop support, Sextus is defeated and chased down and executed in 35. It takes quite a while, though, after Caesar's defeat of the Pompeians at Munda in 45, so a decade later, that Sextus is finally dealt with. And here we have a coin that is the front and back side of the coin that is actually commemorating Sextus's victory over Octavian, so these initial victories. Um, and this is part of what made Octavian nervous and why he does, again, turn to Antony for troop support. So in the aftermath of Sexta, the conflict between Sextus and Octavian, Lepidus thinks that he has an opportunity. So he's been sort of shut out of the power in the triumvirate. He's the one with the least amount that has kind of been ignored, um, has been given Africa to deal with, an important province, but not as important as the rest of the West that Octavian controls or the East that Antony controls. So Lepidus thinks that Octavian is in a position of weakness after the defeat of Sextus. And he steps in and de demands that Sextus's troops actually surrender to him rather than to Octavian. Um, you have Leptus, Lepidus in um, a coin on the side of your um, slide there. Octavian realizes this is a problem, that if he lets this happen, he's admitting weakness, and he's going to become vulnerable, not just to Lepidus, but to Antony. So Octavian realizes he's got to step it up. He then enters into Lepidus's camp and counters by appealing to Lepidus's troops and, in fact, asking Lepidus's troops to come over to him. This is an incredibly bold move. It's, it's a great example of the kind of personal charisma that Octavian must have controlled. Um, and there, we'll see other examples of this as we continue on with our story. But it's one of these great moments where things could have turned out very differently for Octavian had he sat back and let Lepidus take control of his troops, or had he, in fact, not gone into Lepidus's camp at all. But Octavian fights back demands that Lepidus's troops give him their support, and they in fact do so. Um, and this then lays the, found, the, ground, the um, groundwork for Lepidus to be removed from the triumvirate altogether and sent into exile. He's not killed, which is an important thing to note, um, that Antony and Octavian realize it's not in their best interest to have Lepidus's blood on their hands, but they take his troops away, they send him into exile, 
in North Africa and hope that he stays there and hope that he does not become another Marius. So here are some review questions. You can press pause and go over these at your own pace and resume the lecture when you're ready. So after Philippi, remember that Antony stayed in the east. Um, Octavian went to the west. Antony remains in the east in 42 and afterwards. He stays there for a number of different reasons. Um, foremost, he needs to raise money to pay the troops. He's also looking for land to settle the veterans. So there's, ex there's land there that's already in Roman control. There, it's also a place where land confiscations can happen. Um, he needs to deal with rulers who are disloyal to Rome, and in particular rulers who sided with Brutus and Cassius, who had been over in the east prior to Philippi. So he's, he's doing a certain amount of the kind of work that Pompey did when he was in the east, of just making sure that these rulers stay loyal to Rome, but especially to the triumvirate. And he needs to deal with the Parthians. Um, the Parthians saw this conflict between the assassins and the triumvirate as an opportunity possibly to seize control of some Roman territories in the east. So one of the things that Antony is planning is a more serious campaign against the Parthians with the ultimate goal of trying to get the standards back, um, these standards that Crassus had lost. So he's trying to pay back the Parthians, first of all, for support of Caesar's assassins, but also for invading Roman holdings in the east. He's also busy with his romantic life. So remember that Cleopatra had had a romantic relationship with Caesar that had produced a son. She had gone to Rome briefly after Caesar's assassination had been sent back to Egypt. While she's in Egypt and Antony's in the east, the two of them hook up, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's clearly like her relationship with Caesar, a relationship that has a political dimension as well as apparently a private dimension. Um, it's not clear who initiated the meeting, although it may very well have been Antony, who is looking to make sure that Egypt is on the side of Rome, but more specifically his side, in a potential showdown with Octavian. And it's also the case um, that Antony and Cleopatra had probably already met when she was in Rome, and so it may have been a renewal of ties there. But certainly in 41 they have met, and Cleopatra gives birth to twins. Um, it's also probably clear as the comic shows that Antony is looking at Egypt as a particularly prosperous country that he wouldn't mind um, getting his hands on. And here you have another representation of sort of Cleopatra lazing around um, while a flute player plays. But this is a typical representation of the, the queen of Egypt, sort of not seeing her so much as a political figure as a, a woman of leisure. But Antony's love life was complicated. Um, while he is hooking up with Cleopatra, he didn't marry Cleopatra. Um, he was actually married to a Roman woman, Fulvia. And he actually leaves Cleopatra in Alexandria in 40 when all of the, the things are happening that culminate in the Pact of Brundisium in 40. And so he leaves Cleopatra, travels to Italy to deal with Octavian, but also planning to meet up with Fulvia. But Fulvia actually dies while he's en route to, to Italy, to Brundisium. So he's now in 40, wifeless. But remember that then Octavian sees this as an opportunity to marry his sister to Antony. So part of the Pact of Brundisium is the marriage of Antony to Octavia. And Antony then brings Octavia east with him. And the two of them have children. Um, she has two children by Antony. But by 37, Octavia has gone gr grown weary of life in the East, probably grown weary of watching him have this affair with Cleopatra, which had continued on. So she takes her two children by Antony, and when Antony is, is returning to Italy to renew the triumvirate, she accompanies him 
and she remains in Italy after that. Cleopatra then has another son in 36 by Antony, so now a total of three children by Antony. So Antony then, if you're keeping track, has five kids total, two by Octavia, three by Cleopatra. Important to keep in mind that there was really no expectation that he was ever going to legally marry Cleopatra, that he was going to, that there would be a Roman marriage between the two of them, um, and that he would legally recognize their three children. It's unclear exactly what Antony thought he was doing, and one of the things that we should note is that he was not so sensitive to how this would look back home. Certainly it was the case that plenty of Roman men had affairs and had m relationships with multiple women when they were married. But Antony is, is open about this. He's flaunting it. And that, that was a little bit different, and especially doing it with a foreign woman. Um, so there's, there's an oddity here that Antony seems to have been a little bit deaf to how this whole relationship with Cleopatra, and especially the, pr the production of three children, would play back home in Rome. By 36, then, when Cleopatra produces this son by Antony, we also see, really, the unraveling of this second triumvirate. Um, Lepidus has been exiled, and Antony and Octavian are coming down to a conflict, an open conflict. Um, by 36, we really have the, the empire divided into two, east and west, um, with Octavian in the west, Antony in the east. It's also at this time that Antony suffers a serious military setback. He takes on the Parthians and, like Crassus, is severely routed by them. Um, he loses a third of his army. The, the campaign had been going well, but one of his allies, the king of Armenia, who had been providing cavalry support, suddenly freaked out, withdrew his cavalry support, leaving Antony unprotected. And this led then to the, not just defeat, but really rout of Antony and his troops. This was embarrassing. And it was an interesting reversal that at the very time that Octavian could now advertise his finally having a military success when he defeats Sextus Pompey, Antony suffers a serious military setback. So there's a kind of role reversal now between the two. It's also at this time that Octavian married Livia, um, a noble aristocratic woman who had her sights set on being the first woman of Rome, as it were. And it's now that Octavian really launches in a serious way a propaganda war against Antony. Antony's off in the east. He is totally separate from what's happening back in Rome and in Italy. And he's very slow to react to this, this propaganda war um, that Octavian is very successfully launching through not only um, coinage and pamphlets and things like this, but also just through regular speeches. Um, and Antony is busy, perhaps focused on military threats, and probably just unaware of the extent to which this propaganda war is successful. So here are some review questions. You can go over these at your own pace, and when you're done with these, you're done with the lecture. <laughs>